Thank you for signing up for uh, the information session on taxes. This is actually a session of uh, connecting our continent, continent on my YouTube channel. So my name is Loretta Cernowski. I'm with Remax Fine Properties. I am uh, originally from Regina, Saskatchewan, Go Riders, and I'm now living in Scottsdale, <laughs> Arizona. So um, we do have a large population of Canadians that own property in Maricopa County. To be exact, it's 22,762. So when I was uh, working on my, my work visa, I had to do a business plan and I learned about uh, the tremendous impact of Canadians in the state of Arizona. So today we want to talk about the implications of selling your property in Arizona with the CRA as well as the IRS. So I'm just going to go around. You guys can introduce yourselves and tell us what you do and where you're from. I'll go next. Uh, I'm from Vancouver, originally from uh, Manitoba, and I buy and sell real estate in the greater Vancouver area and the metro Vancouver area. I have a very broad client base and a very broad knowledge. So uh, I met uh, Loretta at our Remax Canadian conference in Quebec City, and we came together because of uh, what Loretta just shared with everybody. Well, about... I thought it was wine. <laughs> no? <laughs> wine? <laughs> we we saw a tremendous opportunity for us to work together as partners um, to help Canadians stay informed with what was going on both sides of the border. Exactly. We have the same work ethic. Um, you know, we like to be professional. And so, yeah, we really connected on that side. Yeah. I welcome everybody. Jeff? Melissa? Melissa? Okay. So I'm uh, Jeff Firm. I in, live in Mesa, Arizona, and I work with Doug, who will go next. Uh, he has his his firm. I spend all day, every day working on nothing but FERPTA. That's it. No <laughs> other, no other international tax issues, just FERPTA transactions. So he keeps me busy doing that. All right. But he does a lot of other things in addition to just that. So Doug, you want to introduce yourself? Sure. I'm Doug Kingston. I'm an international tax dinosaur. Um, <laughs> You're been doing it too long. Uh, 12 years before public accounting left Pricewaterhouse, I think like my colleague, Jim Chang, we'll hear from him. Um, but I've been on my own for 25 plus years uh, doing nothing but international tax. International in Arizona uh, is Canadian, eh? Uh, we've got quite a bit of Canadian investment here. And uh, yep, I'm very happy with my Canadian clients uh, helping them where I can. I guess I'll go next. So I'm, I'm also a CPA, CA um, from Vancouver. So I've been an accountant for probably almost like 15 years. Start as an auditor. Now I'm very focused on tax. Gone through a, a lot of in-tax tax trainings to just serving our clients. We, I started with a mid-sized firm. Now I have uh, my own business with my two business owner partners. We have about 20 people. So we're serving about a lot of corporate clients, personal clients, clients coming in to buy their property in Vancouver or vice versa, because uh, as, as we all know, it's worldwide income for all Canadian residents. So any purchases that you make outside of Canada are potentially taxable. So I guess that keep us busy <laughs> helping our clients. First, good. And I'll go next. I'm Julie LaRosa with Stuart Title. Um, I am a sales executive, so I kind of stir up the business and then hand it over to Melissa. So she's the one you want to talk to when you've got transactions going. So I've always had a fondness for Canadians. I've got um, a lot of deep roots in the hockey world. So Loretta and I kind of connected over some hockey stuff. 
Um, and I'm going to do a quick introduction for Melissa because it matters who you work with. And she will be too modest, but I call her the Fructa Fairy because she <laughs> makes things happen. So, Melissa. <laughs> Hi, good morning, everybody. I'm Melissa Finelli. I'm the branch manager at Stewart Title, but escrow officer, have a great escrow team behind me, but we partner with Doug and Jeff and other CPAs to um, manage our Canadians when they actually sell. So I facilitate the closing and the signing and the necessary documentation for FERC to remit the funds to the IRS and walk our clients through the signing closing process because it is a little different here in Arizona. So good morning. So I'll go next. I think I'm the only one here that isn't here trying to drum up business. <laughs> uh, <laughs> my name is Gord Grant. I'm in Vancouver, own a property in Scottsdale. Um, and I'm just really in here because I'm interested to know on how this tax works. I have to make it clear my property is in a family trust. It's not outright owned. Gotcha. So that's basically why I'm here. Okay. Dia, did you want to chime in on who you are? Sure. So my name is Dia Dinka. I am the branch manager over at BMO uh, here in Scottsdale, Arizona. Uh, I too am Canadian. Uh, I grew up in London, Ontario. I moved to the United States in Chicago uh, in to the year 2000. So I've been in the U.S. since the year 2000. I've lived in Arizona for about 10 years now. And so our background here with BMO, as you know, it's a Canadian bank. We do do lending for Canadians here in the U.S. And I'm glad Tim Monroe is on the line as well. He's our mortgage banker and he can uh, chime in too as well. He deals with a lot of Canadians. We also do home equities for Canadians. If they didn't want to touch their first mortgage, we can pull out equity out of their home and and lend to them in that in that aspect as well. So we can pull Canadian credit. Great. Yep. I'm Tim Monroe. I'm also at BMO. I'm on the sales team. And yeah, I deal with a lot of Canadians as well because our parent is the Bank of Montreal in Canada. So uh, I do a lot of mortgages for Canadians buying in some of your warm weather states, Arizona, especially a lot of Florida, a lot of Texas right now, um, where we use, you know, Canadian credit, Canadian income to qualify to buy a property in the States. Um, I'm actually in Chicago, though, but I could lend anywhere in the States. So, Thank you so much. So uh, I met Dia. She's my bank manager um, a couple of weeks ago. <laughs> And I asked her to come and sit in on this because in the upcoming seminar, we're going to talk about 1031 exchanges and what they are for Canadians and how could they, they could make changes, you know, even lateral or whatever. So that's upcoming. We won't talk about that today because today our focus is on FERPTA. And as a REMAX agent here, I will tell you that it is a great time to sell. Um, it's certainly not like it was a year and a half ago, but in some ways that's better. The, the value really hasn't changed, but the average days on market is about 72 to 92. And uh, we have 12,000 listings in the Valley, which really our inventory is, is not great. So it's, it's a great time to be a seller. But on that note, um, we're going to move over to the U.S., CPA guys to talk about um, the U.S. tax rules specifically for to uh, overview and information about that. Okay, I guess uh, at Doug Kingston. Um, I am hopefully showing my uh, screen here with everybody sharing the screen. Yep, we got it. Um, that's our contact information. <clears throat> uh, this is going to go quickly. There's a lot of material. But I guess uh, maybe there'll be a Q&A at the end where I can answer questions. Um, so FERPTA fun facts. Um, <laughs> with, so FERPTA really is a system to tax foreign uh, investors in U.S. real estate. Um, but uh, you can think of it as the withholding tax, the teeth in the law to make sure foreigners pay their fair share. No more burdensome than U.S. taxpayers selling U.S. real estate, by the way. So the withholding tax, it's kind of like a refundable deposit. Concept is government wants to have the upper hand. They want the money in their treasury 
waiting for the foreigner to do what he must do. Um, so the FERPTA withholding applies if you meet the three tests, if you have the three ingredients, your transaction has a three ingredients, and that is a transfer, uh, which includes a sale, and we're gonna be talking mostly about sales transfers, but it includes other transfers like, uh, yeah, quick claim uh, into a legal entity. Um, uh, that's also a transfer subject to FERPTA. Uh, but um, the second requirement, uh, US, yeah, US RPI, Techno Babel, United States real property interest. That's going to be a piece of real estate, um, but uh, also uh, ownership of a legal entity whose assets are primarily invested in US real estate uh, by a foreign person. So this withholding doesn't apply to US persons, um, you know, US citizens, US residents. Uh, IRS knows where they live and so doesn't need the withholding tax that they insist upon if it's a foreign transfer or foreign seller of US real estate. Um, the amount of the withholding is a percentage of the gross proceeds, no deductions. Uh, yeah, we know you paid something to buy it, but uh, the FERPTA withholding is a percentage of gross proceeds. So even if the seller of the foreign seller is sold, selling at a loss, the withholding still applies. Um, the amount of the withholding is calculated on gross proceeds times the applicable rate. There, there are three applicable rates, either zero, which is the best one, uh, or 10%, which is not too bad, or the general rule is 15. Um, but it, the, the application of, well, the determination of which rate depends on a few things. Um, the price, you know, the amount of the, of the sales price, I guess, um, the buyer's use of the property, and then also how the buyer will take title. Those three variables will determine which of the three applicable withholding rates um, is the one for you. Um, <clears throat> the IRS will entertain application for request for reduced withholding, which uh, most often is a reduced withholding at the highest applicable tax rate, but based on the net gain. In other words, the sales price minus co closing costs might have original, original uh, tax basis. Um, who wouldn't do that? Well, it depends. Uh, it's more expensive because it takes the greedy accountant a whole lot more time to do that. And therefore, you know, my cost, it goes up. Um, and uh, yeah, it's not working that well since COVID from a timing standpoint. Uh, we can, yeah, there might be questions on that. I'll let it go for now. Um, both buyers and both sellers and buyers want to make sure they have a US tax ID number. I'm going to say must have a tax ID number, uh, but the foreign sellers typically don't have the US tax ID number, and that's part of the procedure uh, you know, of, of completing the sale. Um, uh, it's the buyer who's responsible with IRS to make sure that withholding tax gets remitted over to the Internal Revenue Service. And if it's late, IRS is going to go after the buyer. I call it little old lady buyer, my example, um, who gets the nasty gram from IRS for thousands of dollars of withholding uh, means big penalties and big interest uh, just for buying her little home. It's not fair, but it's the way the law works. And it does make sense from the government standpoint. Um, so uh, yeah, so the seller uh, must file a US income tax return, but the problem is it's no sooner than the next year. Why do I say that's a problem? Well, it's because to recover the excess withholding tax, the withholding tax based on gross proceeds is usually nine times out of 10 too much. Uh, and the, the income tax return is the vehicle uh, to recover the excess withholding. In other words, file the tax return as soon as you can. Uh, and on that tax return, you report the net gain, you calculate the applicable tax at graduated rates and uh, minus the withholding that government already has equals if the withholding is more than the real tax refund. Um, and uh, yeah, so, you got to wait until the next year, um, unless you apply for the reduced withholding, uh, which I call delayed remittance, 
but um, yeah, it's got issues here uh, timing wise with, with COVID. Um, so uh, yeah, uh, don't forget the Arizona has a state income tax as well. Graduated rates up to almost 3% of the net gain. Arizona has no withholding and unlike the Canadian Revenue Agency has absolutely no affiliation with the Internal Revenue Service. So that whereas a typical foreign seller will have a refund from coming from the US federal government once the return is filed, um, there's an Arizona income tax return and a tax on the net gain. And Arizona has no withholding provision. They're not smart enough to do it like some other states or the federal. So uh, yeah, the number's typically low because the rate's low, but it's a nuisance. Um, and I don't want to leave it unsaid. All right, I've got a little bit of example. Um, so in year one, we have the seller. HUD means the uh, statement of adjustments, I think is the Canadian language for what we call a settlement statement. So our seller uh, is selling for 400,000. IRS wants the withholding uh, calculated at 15% of the 400, so that's $60,000. Seller gets only 340 uh, from close of escrow. But in step number two down below, that little red arrow, the IRS now gets $60,000. And the seller is hoping that IRS is going to put it into the seller's account at IRS. The seller's account at IRS is actually the US tax ID number. Uh, typically known as an ITIN, Individual Taxpayer Identification Number. And uh, so that's why it's important for sellers to make sure that they are on top of getting their, applying for their U.S. tax ID number as soon as they can. And then finally, step number three, you got to wait until next year to file your mandatory U.S. tax return, which at the federal is called 1040NR, non-resident. So on that tax return the next year, um, our, our seller, uh, I think I said buyer, our seller from year one uh, that sold her for 400 needs to account for his net gain. He paid 200 for it. So he has a gain of 400,000. The applicable long-term capital gains tax rate because it's an investment for him. Um, he qualifies for long-term capital gain reduced tax rates. Um, the 15% Tax is 30,000, but he suffered a 60,000 uh, FERP to withholding. Therefore, once IRS will process his US uh, federal tax return for the year, they will grant a $30,000 refund and send that money to him or deposit it into his US bank account if he has one. And then just as a note, the Arizona tax is $771 and it's due it's actually due after the close of the quarter of the sale to avoid the finance charge, uh, but uh, the tax is so low, the finance charge is so low, I typically uh, don't focus on paying it until the next year, which is April 15, the due date for the uh, Arizona state income tax return. All right, I'm gonna turn the floor over to my colleague, Jeff Firm, who's going to talk about common myths and untruths in the FERPTA arena. Mute myself, here we go. So there's a lot of misconceptions uh, just in general terms about uh, how these taxes work, who's really responsible for them, when they're applicable, that type of thing. So I'm gonna go through a number of these with you. Um, uh, if you look at number two there, myth number two, no income tax because the sales price is below 300,000. Remember on Doug's slide, one of the uh, ta withholding tax rate was zero. Well, that happens when it's under $300,000, okay? And you meet several other requirements, all right? But just because it's under 300,000, it could still be at 15%. Let's say you're selling land, just bare land, automatically 15%, right? Doesn't matter if it's $12,000 or $7 million, it's automatically withheld at 15%. So just because the price on a home is under 300,000, you need to know all the rest of the rules 
who bought the house? How did they take title? What is their intended use of the property before you actually get to the correct withholding percentage? Um, okay, how about uh, I have a social security number because I worked down in the States for a number of years when I was younger. And because I have a social security number, obviously I don't need to pay US taxes. I'm going to be treated as a U.S. tax citizen, okay, or a resident. And th the answer to that is no, you're not if you're residing in Canada and you're spending more than six months out of a year up in Canada. So, uh, yes, your Social Security number, I have yet to see an instance uh, apart from um, uh, when people denounce their citizenship, um, I have yet to see an instance where social security number expires. They simply don't. So if you happen to have a social security number, we'll use it for your tax identification number. If you don't have a social security number down here, we'll apply for an I-10 or an individual taxpayer identification number for you. All right. Those are basically good for about three years from the time you last filed uh, a tax form. So let's say you got one back in 2012 and you, you had a sale back then and you haven't used it since, we need to renew that. You keep the same number. You don't get a new number. It's just like a driver's license. Uh, and and you'll, get a new, uh, you'll get a renewal, which will be good for another three years. A lot of people think that the... SIN number, social insurance number from Canada can be used as a taxpayer identification number down here. It's excellent for Canada. It doesn't work at all here in the States. So just kind of go through that. Um, and another, another item, what, what happens if you transfer property? I want to avoid my FERP to transaction uh, uh, withholding tax. So gosh, what would happen if I just simply transferred it into an LLC? Okay. So all kinds of things happen at that point, uh, potentially, but you could be, could be letting yourself in for double withholding tax once for the LLC's quote purchase of the, of the uh, property. Second one for the sale of the property by the LLC. So, quote, tricky little maneuvers uh, to help avoid taxation simply don't work down here. The IRS has got a pretty good clamp on it. Um, I guess one other thing, let's see, let's see, the tax cost. Doug did a good job in terms of explaining the, that the withholding tax is really a prepayment of your capital gains tax that we file next year for you. That's really what it is. Um, and it's not, it's, it's really a prepayment because you're gonna get back a bunch of that money, typically, all right? I, I have yet to, Doug may have run across some, but I've been doing this for a number of years and I haven't run across uh, a standard uh, FERP to transaction that did not get a uh, refund back from the withholding tax typically. So they really want you to have skin in the game. So those are some of the common misperceptions um, of, of uh, uh, FERPTA. And from there, I'll, I'll pass it baton back to Doug. Well, I think we're probably absorbed our time. I've got a few more sl slides, but uh, yeah, if there's some questions, I might, these next slides are relevant, we'll come back. So I'll, I'll, I'll pass the baton to, uh, to the next speaker I or take questions, uh, whatever, you know, mediator, whatever you want to do. I have, I have a quick question, simple question on this, the slide that you showed us before where you use the, um, example of 400,000, 200,000. So at that one right there. So at the end of the day, when everything's said and done, you're paying $30,000 plus the Arizona tax of 771, and that money's gone. Is that correct? correct? Okay. Correct. That's your U.S. tax cost. Okay. So 
you you sell your property you pay the firm to tax a year later you're going to get maybe 50 percent of that back and that's the best you're ever going to do right um, well, I mean, 50%, there's no magic rule on that or, or uh, whatever you're, you're going to recover your excess withholding at the end of the day. Okay. So, so does the, it have any bearing, is, any bearing on what you paid for your property? Improvement absolutely. Improvement because and then what you sell right, it for? the, the real tax is graduated rates on the net gain. That's the real tax, your tax, okay. your real so, tax, your ultimate tax cost is a function of the net gain does it take into consideration any improvements you put into your unit yes major improvements and additions not repairs or maintenance unless required to close the sale like buyer mandated uh repairs yeah. you know those like, those should like count. upgrading remodeling things like right. that Impro major so, improvements and additions are part of the cost base so myself here let's say 200,000 I paid for mine a little bit less than that 10 years ago I have no mortgage on I just paid cash for it um so say 200,000 I probably put I don't know let's say I put 100,000 into it and I'm going to sell it for 450 so okay. my withholding tax which say 15 percent is going to be on the difference is no correct no, 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 it's 450 times 15% or 10% if the buyer's nice to you. Okay. So that's 67,500 yeah. is probably what the, the withholding tax you're facing. Okay. But if it meets the requirement to sustain only the, the reduced 10% withholding rate, then it's going to be 45,000 instead of 67,500. What are the requirements? The buyer needs to intend to use the property during the next two years as a residence defined as eh, basically a main home or a vacation home where okay. he and his family will use it more than any, any third party. Same as I'm using it now. The buyer needs to take title in his own human being name, not in the name of any legal entity. Okay. If you flunk any of those three tests, it's 15. Okay. Okay. Thank you. And can you speak to the less than three hundred thousand? What are what are the other items that would be <clears throat> that FERPTA would not apply? You said it just because well, it's less than three hundred. Well, yeah, under under three hundred, uh, if the buyer intends to use it as a residence and takes title in his human being name, then there's no withholding. But that doesn't mean there's no U.S. income tax. Everything else still applies. There's just no withholding. So the next year, the foreign seller at under 300000 must file a U.S. tax return to report the net gain times the whatever the, the, the graduated rate tax uh, rate is and then needs to come out of pocket to pay the whole tax, which uh, he kind of should have paid during the year after the close of the quarter of the sale but there's no withholding under 300 if the buyer's nice to you, is what I call me the other three tests. Um, I don't know who can answer this, maybe you, Melissa, but have you ever seen where an investor actually writes in the, the tax rate sort of as a concession that they would pay it? Uh the sell the buyer would pay it i don't understand the concession well say so say the seller is you know liable for the 30000 as example on the screen so mm -hmm. he's not a resident say it's an investor uh would it be possible for the buyer to write into the contract that they would pay the 15% tax rate like um, I doubt you're going to, I doubt you're going to get a buyer to pay it. And it's really the liability of the seller, the actual foreign person to pay it. Okay. I've never seen a buyer get involved in the payment of FERPTA. It's 100% the seller's responsibility. It's on the seller's sell side of the settlement figures.
Let me let me correct something here for just a second. The the liability of the payment of the withholding tax in the is the buyers is the buyers. Right. right. Okay. It all the money comes from the seller's proceeds. Yes. Okay. And I and I agree. I have I have never heard of uh, a buyer stepping up to pay that in addition to the agreed sales price. It is just, just, I haven't seen it ever happen. Um, yeah. Technically, could it happen? I, I suppose in some bizarro world, someone, someone with just tons of money and didn't <laughs> care could potentially do it, I suppose, you know? And right. it would be subject to withholding. The, the premium would be subject to more withholding. Uh, you'd have to gross it up to come up with a, with a number. It makes absolutely no sense. Okay. And a buyer would have to be pretty stupid to go along with that. Right. <laughs> okay. If there's no questions, we'll move on to Jim Chang. All right. So... Uh... I'm yeah, gonna start sharing here. Sure, thank you. That would help. I'll share my screen. And then I will okay. Can you see my slideshow now? Yes. Yep. All right. <laughs> so before I begin my presentation, I would like to share that. Uh, CRA from the Canadian side, we do have a similar way of withholding taxes. If someone were to come here as a non-resident to buy uh, properties in, in Canada, and when they sell, they go through a very similar process of what Doc and Jafford had mentioned. I mean, the process are sort of similar, but the rules, of course, are different, different rates. And and the process can be taken as long as over a year as well, because the taxes will be filed in the following year. But since the focus of today is to have uh, most of the Canadians uh, or, or other parts of the world of the potential buyers going to U.S. to buy, and I'm, um, and, well, more for the Canadians today, I guess I'm focusing on what's the implications when you buy and sell uh, properties outside of um, Canada in general. So I'm gonna go to the next slide here. So I'm gonna focus on what what's what's principal resin because then as as I speak, you you understand that can actually play a role even for properties that's you know held outside of Canada. So most people misunderstood that the principal resident exemption that is gonna be applied that allow you to sell your own principal resident tax-free, only it's available from the properties within Canada, which is not true. If you claim that your principal resident is actually in Arizona and you remain yourself as a Canadian resident paying your taxes year to year, that property that you sold can potentially qualify as uh, the principal resident exemption which allow you to sell the property tax-free from CRA perspective, obviously. So I'm gonna go through other sort of potential tax planning perspective of if you change from your principal resident to rental properties, which applies to, again, both properties in, in well, mostly in Canada, but um, unfortunately not apply for a property outside. Um, but there's also the, when you decide to buy properties in the U.S. as an investment instead of a principal resident, what happened when you sell? And, and the recent residential flipping rule that applies to Canada, maybe that is sort of a lesson focus of today, but that is also relevant to all the Canadian residents uh, in Canada too. And other tax planning opportunity and the foreign income and asset reporting, if we have time, so I'll start with this. Most people know if you're a Canadian resident, when you sell, you will need to report your disposition, but it wasn't uh, a mandatory until 2020, uh, 2016. So what happened is when you sell, CRA would like to know you are selling a property, whether it's taxable or not. 
you are obligated to report this to CRA. So I, I, I don't intend to go in more further detail than that. That's why I sort of provide all the text. Since this is recorded, uh, everyone will have the opportunity to read into the details. So the so how would you designate? So every year that you reside your own principal resident, you get one year extra year of counts toward that to be sell for tax free. For example, let's say if you own this property for 10 years, but you only reside in this place for five years as your principal residence and five years as your rental property, typically you'll get a five and there's a one plus rule, six out of 10 years of the capital gains that will be taxable. So then you'll be only paying tax on the 40% of the total gain that when you sell. So that's sort of a mathematical way of looking at that. But it gets a little bit complicated if you have more than one residence that you re you serve as a principal resident. There's only one principal residence that you can be designating in any given years, but, uh, but you are allowed to have multiple personal use residents uh, at the same given time. And if you have two or more that, that you actually serve them as a personal use properties throughout, let's say a, year, a time frame of 10 years again, you, you can technically allocate the, the one year, each year that accumulate to whichever property that, that gives you the most benefit to save your taxes. So, so that's why sometimes it can get, be a little bit complicated because, because you might be selling them at a different years. So that's where we come in and do the calculation to figure it out. So, so why are we talking about this? Again, the Arizona properties that you may have purchased for your vacation home, say you only stay there for two, three months of the year, that can potentially be qualified for the principal resident exemption as well. But it depends whether you have another one located in BC, let's say, or any other parts in Canada. So we'll have to look into the individual situation and see how this such rules can you know, benefit the individual. So just sort of give you a taste on, um, it's not as simple as where you stay most of the time and that will be the, the one that is principal resident. So there will be other cases that can be a little bit of sort of tax planning involved. So the next topic of sort of the tax planning advice will be when oftentimes people move on to the next principal resident and keep the first one and turn that into rental property, right? So from the Canadian perspective, um, it, it triggered a, what we call a change of use. And when there is a change of use from a principal rest to rental or for business purpose, there has to be a thin disposition that occurs that potentially there is a, a tax triggering events. So, but however, there are certain elections that you can make so then that is being reversed of them not have change of use. And, and on top of that, you can potentially get four extra years of, of treating adding on as the principal residence, even if, the, if it's in fact rented it out. So there are some criteria that you need to obviously meet but but again, the, here is sort of give you a, a flavor of taste uh, of what is possible and, and how can it be done if it happens to you and think for the advice on whether you actually meet such requirement. And this is actually a quite a powerful tool to get four extra years. I can give you a very easy example and how this rule has came about many decades ago. A lot of a lot of the taxpayer that they maybe got a new job opportunity, say they originally lived in Vancouver and they moved to Toronto for a better job opportunity, but they don't know what's gonna happen. They're gonna go there. They're, gonna, they're not gonna commit to purchase another principal there because maybe in two years, they may not like the job, may not like the city. They decide to move back to Vancouver, for example. So, but then the principal resident that they have held on in Vancouver, they wouldn't want to sell until they 
know that they're gonna permanently move to Toronto. So, so they're gonna try to rent it out. So here the government comes in and say, well, if your intention to move out there for, for just to give it a, you're not gonna hold on to another principal resident. You're just gonna rent it out for a couple of years. We're gonna give you a break. We're gonna give you up to four years. If you make this election, <clears throat> even if you stay there for four years, and rent this Vancouver property for four years. And when you sold it after the four years, you essentially will still get every year's tax free. So, so that is again, a powerful rule that you know, can be applicable to some taxpayers. So let me move on to sort of the next part of the presentation of, if you were to buy properties in Arizona for investment purpose, not for your personal use. So you buy one and you most of the part of the time that you, you rent it out for you know, making a profit. So what happened to it? Are, are you a flippers? Are you a long-term holders, right? So if, if you think that the market is so good that you're gonna buy and you're gonna help for a short term and you want to sell for gaining a profit, Oftentimes, CRA will look into that as sort of a business income. That means 100% income inclusion. So if you were to make, say, 50,000 profit all of it, that 50,000 profits, net of all expenses, will be added on top of your income that you have been reported in that given year. And, and together, you'll be taxable at the progressive tax rates. So it really depends on what other source of income you have because uh, the higher income that you have in the region, uh, the higher tax rate that you have. And for the end of the I will show you a, a sort of a progressive tax rate that uh, Canada has uh, with federal and BC in general. So, so there is also the GST considerations. So of course, the properties that you buy outside of Canada is not subject to that. But if you were to buy properties within Canada, there are, GST consideration to, to be looked at. But since the, the focus today is to purchase the property in Arizona, I will not touch into more details than that. Just sort of wanted to give you a reminder in case you happen to be buying and sell properties in BC or in general in Canada. So if you were to buy and hold in long term, let's say if you rent it for a couple of years and when the market is good or when you need the money, you decide to sell. In general, when you were, your intention was to buy and hold and to generate rental business, they say I give you a break as if they think the appreciation of the property was not intentional. It wasn't your primary purpose when you, you buy the property. So they give you a break and they will treat that in general as a capital gain, which we all know right now it's about 50%. 50% income inclusion, which means giving back to the same example, if I were to buy and sell and make a profit of 50,000, only 25,000 will be added into your lump sum of your income of the given year and be taxed at. So again, there could be a possible in, you know, GST consideration if you were to buy property in BC or in Canada. So just a friendly reminder for that. So, so this slide is maybe a little bit irrelevant for investors buying outside of Canada, but since most of the audience will be uh, Canadian residents in this case, so I'd like to draw everyone's attention that there is what they came about a flipping rules in Canada, starting in 2023, that if you were to buy and sell within 12 months, whether your reason or intention wasn't to do so, they were still gonna ding you to be a business income, which is a 100% inclusion income, unless you meet certain exceptions, such as you know the death of the taxpayer or the related families or the you know, uh, breakdown of the mar marriage. And there's a couple other ones that you could possibly meet the criteria. The next will be sort of, sort of a different focus on you know, how we as a Canadian 
taxpayers, we are subject to worldwide income. And if we were to try to buy U.S. properties uh, as an investment, what are some tax planning opportunities? Typically for individual taxpayers, they, they have a regular job, their, their income source are not a variety. So, so this might not be solely applicable to them, but there are also taxpayers that are actually business owners and they run their own incorporation companies and how this actually can potentially benefit them quite a lot. So uh, typically, as you can see that the company, let's say, let's say as easy as uh, restaurant owners, they might have run two restaurants with operating company number one and two, and they typically can set up the whole code in between for legal and tax considerations because under the same sort of association group of the companies that they hold, the first 500,000 that they make, they are only being taxed at 11% flat uh, to meeting some of the requirements, obviously. And, and that's a quite powerful rule to have their company business hiding under the companies. Because if you were to run a self-employed business income and you were to make 500,000, you're subject to all the progressive tax rate, which after about uh, 240,000, you are paying at a marginal tax rate at 53.5%. So then now you ask me, well, if the company is only paying 11%, uh, and what happened after. Then the money actually with the right corporate structure set up, they can flow this money tax-free to their whole companies. And why we, we want a holding company? It's just to stay, sort of move the money away from the operating companies that maybe are subject to a higher risk of being, let's say, sued. Because what if a, a, a customer had a, a food there and they got food poisoning and they want to sue the restaurant. And all, if your all assets are sort of retaining in this restaurant company, you are subject to a high risk of being taken away because of the lawsuit issues. It's not like if your money moving to the whole code will be subject, you know, it will be risk-free, but that gets that one extra layer of protection. Again, I'm not a lawyer, that will be something that if you wanted to consult your lawyer when you set up the property as well, uh, uh, the sort of the corporate structure. So, so flipping back to the money that you can flow up to your whole goal free. So now, you know, if you were to compare someone that does not have a company, they every 500,000, they probably retain about maybe close to 300,000 money in the company, uh, in their personal hand to buy properties in Arizona, for example, but the comp the people who actually holds the money in this with the proper setup for 500,000, they will probably have just under 450,000 to reinvest. So the amount of money that they can invest are, are, are in general more with the right corporate structure setups. Okay, Jim, I'm so sorry to interrupt. Let's wrap it up in like another minute because we're on a tight time frame here and we've still got a few more people to go. So if you could yes. spend like another minute and just wrap it up, we would certainly appreciate it. Of course. Of Thank course. you. So so, so this foreign income tax, well, I'll quickly mention that as uh, so a tax, uh, tax residence, you're subject to worldwide income. That means as it's generating as it is. If you were to make a dollar in the U.S., you're supposed to report that dollar as your income. But instead of reporting as the, whether you needed to report your assets outside of Canada, it's only if in total you have more than 100,000 Canadian dollars. So, and, and there, here is quickly a list of things that may be subject to reporting requirement when you hit the 100,000 mark. So cash for shares, Mutual fund held of outside of the financial, outside of sort of Canada financial institution and some debt that you lend it to someone else and possible insurance policy you bought outside of Canada. So that will conclude actually my presentation and I will open up to any questions and, and, and I'll try to answer to my best ability here. So Jim, I have one request. Could you talk just briefly about 
foreign tax credit for a Canadian resident having realized a gain selling US real estate because that foreign tax credit is important. Yes. So so with with the Canadian and, and US, we do have a tax treaty in place, as that always know too. Uh, so so there are the mechanics that the taxes that you pay in US can be applied against the actual tax that you pay in Canada. So typically in this case would be Doug, Doug will focus on his part of the work. He will complete his part of the work and will realize how much taxes that this taxpayer has paid. And with, with the tax returns that we have on hand, we'll figure out how much taxes that, that this taxpayer has paid in US, you know, federally and states wise, and we'll bring that tax over to offset dollar to dollar with the, the Canadian tax that you will be paying. Of course, the actual calculations can be a little bit complicated it, because it depends on the ratio of income source of the Canadian versus US and certain tax credits will be applied. But in most cases, you, the, every dollar that you pay in most cases will be applicable as a reduction subject to some is, exceptions. Any other questions that you might have? I think that's great, Jim. Thank you. All right. So I will move this. Uh, I will unshare this. And we're going to move on to uh, Melissa to talk about the title side. Oh, I think you're muted. Hi, hi. <laughs> Um, okay, let me share my screen here. So the question I get a lot is why is a title company involved in all of this? Um, and really the, you know, the IRS puts it on the title company and they have for many years um, to have the title company report the sale of the property. And so that's how we are involved since we do all of the closing we handle um, everything through, uh, you know, filing the uh, sale of the property to the IRS. Um, so let me see if I can get my screen here. Hold on. A little bit bigger. There we go. Um, so the title company, uh, we do report the sale of the property to the IRS so that we typically, as soon as we get notified that the seller is Canadian, we reach out to all the parties, let them know, and then it's up to us to determine what that buyer is, what their use of the property is going to be, if they're going to occupy it as a primary residence, we actually have an affidavit that they sign uh, based on the sales price, what their intention is, and they put it in writing to us so that we can determine or we can help the seller determine um, you know, how FERP is going to be handled. So we do coordinate with everyone. Uh, we work closely with Doug and Jeff to have the appropriate documentation uh, prepared. It's super important that that documentation is prepared correctly. Um, and having a CPA involved in that is imperative, I think, in my world. Um, rarely do I have a, a citizen, just a regular seller, consumer, say, um, a buyer, say, oh, I'm going to prepare the documents myself. Um, nobody really wants to take that on or tackle that unless they do have some tax background. So I always encourage a CPA to be involved. And we partner with Doug and Jeff quite a bit um, to get those documentations. So I facilitate getting those signed. I facilitate, uh, you know, having everybody review them. And then I am responsible for cutting that check and sending the appropriate documents to the IRS within 20 days of closing. And that is a big deal because if it's after 20 days, it's a big penalty of taxes. So, um, I, uh, I also wanted to just mention that there's title companies here in the Valley that say they will prepare the FERP to documents themselves rather than having a CPA do it or rather than the consumer doing it. 
And they also, there's title companies that get into big trouble because they don't keep track of that 20 day, um, you know, post closing uh, rule to get the money to the IRS. So uh, the other couple of things I just wanted to mention is having a U.S. taxpayer identification number does make FERPTA go faster, or at least it's a little smoother. So even when Canadians are listing property for sale, that might be a good time to connect with, a, with Doug and Jeff to have that filing and get that U.S. taxpayer identification number process started. Um, the other thing that might uh, alleviate some buyer concern uh, to Loretta, um, if you wanted to put in the MLS that the seller is already partnered with a CPA to help with FERPTA, that might put a buyer's concern and confusion at ease. And then the buyer can correspond directly with the CPA and get any questions answered directly. And then the only other couple of things I just wanted to touch on, we do have some closing processes here between Canada and the U.S. Probably the most important one is that we do not recognize Canadian notaries on U.S. documents. Uh, you can go to an embassy there, but the most, uh, the most common thing is that a practicing attorney licensed in Canada can notarize U.S. documents. So uh, the deed and those kind of things, a Canadian who's physically in Canada can go to an attorney's office, have them signed and notarized, FedEx them back to us for closing. We coordinate that well in advance of closing. And then we do... Uh, Transfer the proceeds. Many times uh, Canadians have US dollar accounts here in the US, not a problem. We do a simple wire transfer. If it is an international wire, so it's going to cross that border into a bank into Canada, you have to have the SWIFT code. And it usually takes two business days depending on what time we close. So any questions from the closing escrow side, I'm available. Um, you can certainly call our office. And I'll just say on the real estate agent side, um, because as you guys know, we don't have title companies in Canada. So when you are filling out the listing agreement, you can put in the comments what title company that you prefer to use. And I think we've all you know, understood that sewer title definitely knows what they're talking about. They surround themselves with the right professionals. And the last thing you want to worry about is <laughs> not understanding you're getting your withholding. So um, it's important. And as a buyer, um, you know, you, you also can put which title company that you want to use to. So that's important. So it's obviously who I choose because of their experience and knowledge on um, dealing with Canadians. Thanks. Okay, guys, I think we've taken up enough of your Saturday morning. Uh, I'd like to thank everyone for their uh, presenta presentation today. I certainly learned a lot. And I will be sending out everyone's contact information to everyone who signed up. I do actually have a lot of people who asked for the recording. And if it's okay, I'm going to share that as well on social media. So uh, everyone have a fantastic weekend. Happy Mother's Day to those who are mothers. And uh, yeah, anyone else have any comments before we wrap up? It was excellent. Awesome. Okay, thank you, for you guys. Thank you so much. Uh, have a great weekend. Thank, you. Thank, thank you. you. have a nice weekend. Nice weekend. Happy, Happy Mother's Day. Bye. Happy Mother's Day.